I'm Henry from Fortress on a Hill. We're a leftist veteran podcast that aims to expose the reality of the U.S. military's many wars abroad, the horror that it puts on the people that live in those places, and the damage that military service does to Americans. Congress has abdicated its role, giving oversight to the military. Fortress on a Hill aims to change that. Fortressonahill.com or wherever you get your podcast. Now, back to Lions Led by Donkeys. Show you the world. And now I'm about to drop a whole new world of knowledge on you. Aladdin was one of the most Orientalist films of all time. And Professor Walter Denny, who's taught Orientalist art for decades, agrees. Like those first three or four minutes of the Disney movie Aladdin are basically very prejudicial. They create a very, very false and very, very prejudicial view of the Islamic world. Before I upset you anymore, let me tell you why it's so bad by explaining what Orientalism is. Historically, Orientalism refers to the study of the Arab and Muslim world, or what was for a long time referred to as the Orient, which included more than just Arab or predominant Muslim societies. And the discipline basically looked at those societies as though they were interchangeable, inferior, and well, mystical and savage. Just the fact we say there's an Arab or Muslim world is proof of how pervasive that way of thinking was and is. But now, Will Yeomans, a professor of media studies and public affairs, says the definition has evolved. It's become to mean something else, a critique actually of a particular way of knowing about that part of the world. The late Palestinian American professor, author, and activist Edward Said wrote the book on Orientalism, making his Palestinian Arab identity central to his work. Fanaticism, violence, etc., always associated with the Arabs, with Islam, and so on and so forth. Arabs are always being killed. They're always associated publicly in the, in the public. Hello, life. and welcome to another episode of the Lines Led by Donkeys podcast. I'm Joe, and with me today, as always, seemingly the last couple weeks, is our man in Kurdistan, Travis. Hello. And so this episode is uh, different because we're not doing like. A, a history bit, I guess. Um, well, I guess we are, but we're not talking about an event in history as much as we are uh, going over one of, I guess, Travis's passions, which is <laughs> Middle Eastern history and um, one of mine, which is bullshit historical revisionism. Um, mm. But this all goes back to a concept known as Orientalism. And I'm going to let Travis explain that because I have never fucking heard of it before. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so Orientalism, um, it's kind of a difficult concept to explain easily um, for a number of reasons. But uh, the basic premise um, is, well, the, the term was kind of coined by um, a Palestinian-American academic by the name of Edward Said, who wrote a book in the 1970s called uh, Orientalism. And that's where the term comes from. And the, the concept is basically um, uh, the idea of this sort of ideological construction of the quote-unquote Orient or the East, um, which in his which generally includes like North Africa, Middle East, and then Central, South, and East Asia. So like everything from Morocco to Japan is the the East. And this object of the East is somehow um, a like a, a single, knowable, quantifiable object, which is therefore opposed to and inherently separate from a simultaneously constructed body of the quote-unquote West. Um, and if that's kind of difficult to understand, like I'm with you, I start like I first read Orientalism my sophomore year of college and I didn't really get it until like my senior year of college. Um, but the basic idea is it's creating these artificial limited constructs of, of knowledge. Like if you, um, uh, like if you claim to know the Middle East or something like that, you are kind of buying into an Orientalist concept that the Middle East is somehow a tangible, quantifiable, knowable, single thing that somebody, any one person can know, like in its entirety. It, to um, me, it kind of sounds like, um, what's a, a, I'm the, I'm the dumb guy here. Uh, like, 
like if, if a history or a philosophy is written about somewhere by like a colonial master who could basically who could it's like colonial thought like I, if, I, yeah if the yeah. british east india company wrote a book no that's that's exactly right i'm i'm glad you kind of said that because it jarred me out of trying to kind of confusing myself um <laughs> so yeah like orientalism is isn't necessarily prejudiced against the peoples and cultures of the east um because there were the the idea or edward said when he wrote it was basically talking about um the the body of knowledge regarding asia the middle east and so on and that stemmed from like basically colonial officers writing about the regions in which they were posted and helping colonize. Um, and so this means that there were not just like bad Oriental Orientalists who were, you know, super racist, murderous colonial officers. There were good Orientalists as well who were, you know, Arabophiles or Sinophiles or um, the Arabists of the 19th century, early 20th century. These yeah. people were, you know, they fell in love with um, the, the cultures that and places in which they were posted. But, the way they wrote about or discussed or thought they knew about the places in which they were post posted fell nonetheless fell into like an orientalist concept of the east as somehow inherently other and different from the west that uh, that's something i ran into recently uh, i know anybody who follows my stupid shit posting on twitter i wrote uh, a paper, uh, a research paper on the Sykes Pico agreement, which created the modern day Middle East and ruined everything. Uh, <laughs> in case you want to save yourself reading 10 pages, that's what my paper boils <laughs> down to. But, um, uh, you know, there was Arabists who were deeply in love with, with the culture and everything like you were talking about, but they were just so wrong on so many things because, you know, yeah. they created the Sykes Pico agreement. And they're like, no, nah, the <laughs> Arabs will love this. Let's just exactly. let's let's just cookie cutter this shit all apart, and yeah. everything no, will be fine. Yeah. So basically, by the, the this ideological construct of the East in opposition to the West, um, it basically it it allows for and it was essentially like designed around the colonial imperial project that Europe was undertaking throughout the 19th century and early 20th century. So Orientalism as an as an idea was born in the European scramble to conquer the entire world. Um, and as such, the idea of Orientalism carries with it all of the baggage of that time period, meaning that even the, the so-called good Orientalists are part and parcel of the, of the imperial project. Um, and Orientalism, like I said, is more than just racism. One can be a racist, but not necessarily Orientalist. And one can be Orientalist without necessarily being racist. And, uh, and in fact, this the whole episode that we're going to uh, be talking about after I describe Orientalism <laughs> is basically a demonstration of Orientalism. And, uh, but also, like, you have to understand that, like, who are we, two white guys who don't speak Arabic or, you know, Hindi or Chinese or Turkish to really discuss the idea of Middle Eastern history? And, like, that very idea is itself, or the idea of, like, me even pretending to be, like, any sort of Middle Eastern expert is uh is kind of is very much like an orientalist concept like I, I i'm not fluent in arabic let alone you know any specific dialect of arabic um is it so bad i always assumed you were <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, you live in kurdistan i assume you speak kurdish or arabic <laughs> i sh should have asked <laughs> i mean i'm familiar like i've studied it but I, I would never even call myself even close to fluent um but uh yeah, like I, I'm never going to really be able to call myself like an, an expert um, in uh, in the Middle East or in Iraq or in anything uh, with like a, a clear conscience because it's not true. I mean, I can never really know all of Iraq or all of the Middle East. Um, I can, you know, I may know more than the average person, but I don't know it, you know, because there is no it to know. Um, and, uh, because it's a constant, it's a dynamic, constantly changing, amorphous, undefinable, unquantifiable, unqualifiable thing. Um, that's not even a thing. Like it's, it's just so the, you have, but in order to learn, you have to create these constructs. And so the very idea that I am sitting here today trying to tell people about like the Middle East is in a, is a, a sense Orientalist. Um, that doesn't mean it's like bad. But the whole point is to um, 
to identify the, that these constructs, these uh, constructs of knowledge exist so that going forward when you're doing research or when you're trying to learn about a topic, you you understand where they come from. And I think like to understand where Orientalism comes from and to then apply that to reading things or learning things in the in the present day, you have to understand that um, like the uh, the legacy of colonialism is baked into every aspect of every society on Earth. Um, and like to say that again for the people in the back, the legacy of colonialism is baked into every aspect of every society on Earth. Um, and do you, would you say that like the the countries who were colonialized are 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 much more affected by it uh, present day? I mean yeah. that, that sounds stupid yeah. when I say it out loud, but there's a lot of people. Uh, shitty racists especially they're like well fuck africa's been free since like 1960 and there's they still can't get their <laughs> shit together like there's a whole lot to yeah, unpack exactly. there man yeah, um exactly but- there's always a lot more to unpack and like so as um as a west as someone in the so-called west which is itself a construct um you know at an american university or british university or something you have to when you want to learn about the history or the current day or current day, the, the present day of like the Middle East or something like that, learning where these where the knowledge that you are studying comes from and what the legacy of the of where that knowledge comes from is like super important to understanding um, like how to avoid playing into the same problems and tropes and imperial projects of the past. Like, I mean, like imagine um you know, like some Saudi guy or like some Indian guy who doesn't speak any English, who's never been to the U.S., trying to claim to be like an American expert because he like, I don't yeah, know, he like went McDonald's to McDonald's once. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, like they went to McDonald's once or maybe like went to New York um, for vacation for a week and uh, know a few words of, of English. And then they go back to, you know, Saudi Arabia or India or something like that. And then they uh, teach a class called like, America a study or teach American studies in college. And yeah, you know, this uh, is, I think one of the things that we can do uh, to confront that is well, to do just that. And it's like uh, confront it, um, mm-hmm. historical revisionism and like colonial thought and all this other shit. Like just, we have to attack it for a lack of a better exactly. word. And I think that's why we're here today. Um, exactly. Like there, you can't really avoid it so much, but you can understand what it is and where it comes from. And especially cause, all right. So to get to our point, um, th- this, <laughs> yeah. there's this article that was written by a guy named Norville B D Atkin or Atkin. I, I, I'm probably saying is I'm going to call him fucking Norville. Cause it's the worst Norville. name on earth. <laughs> the article is called why Arabs lose wars. And it was written in 1999 so this precludes the uh, you know this is before the u.s invasion of iraq and this year like all the major problems in the world today this is before then um <laughs> yeah uh also uh this article is really fucking popular i uh when when travis brought it to me uh when you brought it to me i i'd seen it probably two or three dozen times floating through Facebook. It got turned to a YouTube video, uh, which Norville definitely did not do himself. Um, <laughs> and it is really popular in the new wave, new wave colonialism. Is that yeah. a thing? Uh, that Neo-imperialism, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And it is something that has been shared. I've seen it on Facebook from probably more military friends that I care to count. Um, because it speaks to the American experience in Iraq largely. Um, mm-hmm. And we are going to read this article at length. And I'm going to get very upset while Travis tries to be an academic about it. Uh, before, <laughs> also get upset. Yeah. Before we get into the, the meat of this article, um, mm-hmm. I'm going to do what I do, which is attack Norval's personality. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think this is, this is important. Um, be dick jokes aside um when we are reading this from a historical perspective or when you're reading something that's supposed to be from an expert like i'm never going to claim to be an expert about anything um Mm -hmm. but you know it when you look at his research methods and you look at the people he cites in the article and he and 
uh, who he associates with. All these things are important um, to me, at least, because it, it damages his credibility. Uh, I once took a religions class probably a decade ago, and uh, my professor uh, said, you should always look at the authoritative voice of things when you're reading them. And that means like, you know, who they're targeting at the time and where that person comes from. Um, so, uh, Norville is a retired, uh, officer from the army. He was, a, he was a Colonel, uh, and he taught at the U S Naval Institute, uh, which according to the Naval Institute quote has taught middle Eastern political military affairs in the special operations community for 17 years. He also wrote the forward to a book called the Arab mind by Raphael Patai. Um, so <laughs> that book is interesting. It is a long, strange tome that focuses on uh, like chapters, dozens of pages on the sexual habits of people within the Arab culture. Yeah, dude, the, the, one of the things I was re reading a lot about when I was in college studying, uh, Orientalism was like this, the intense, like sexual obsession of white people in Europe during, well, especially during like the colonial era, but with like the sexual behavior of Arab men and women. And it's like really fucking creepy. That, that's one of those weird things that colonialists always are obsessed with. Um, there was, I was reading about uh, the British uh, East India company in the Adamant Islands. Um, mm. And most people know about the Adamant Islands because the guy who got <laughs> fucking shot to death with bow and arrows on the sent on the North Sentinel Island uh -huh. not that long ago. But one of the things they liked to uh, the, one of the, um, quote unquote adventure historian type people you know, they didn't actually go to college but he had a fucking one of those weird khaki hats and shorts and <laughs> you know he he wrote a lot but um they he liked to take pictures of the adamanese people naked and like watch <laughs> them fuck that was like yeah. <laughs> that was their thing uh but the arab mind is uh, is a book I th I think it was written in the seventies, um, and it's uh, a book that Edward Said attacks directly in Orientalism. But um, yeah. Seymour Hirsch, uh, journalist for the New Yorker, said that the the Arab Mind book is uh, just a giant tome of racism. Um, yeah. And I don't know if this has anything to do with it, but Raphael Patai is a lifelong Zionist who grew up in uh, the violence of the Palestinian Mandate. So. That may have impacted his work a bit. Um, yeah, a, a lot of the uh, the kind of modern neo imperialists or kind of neo orientalists are very much um, uh, into the. I mean, I, I don't want to sound like this. This might sound a little too like you know anti Semitic conspiracy theory, but very much into like the Zionist movement. Um, like uh, Ephraim Karsh is one of the big ones who's a big Middle Eastern historian, but is also like super fucking racist because <laughs> he's like, um, very much into the like, yeah, like the Israel should just like fucking nuke Gaza kind of thing. I mean, that's not anti-Semitic to point out that people who like it, it would be like me being I mean, I'm not an Armenian nationalist, but let's say an Ar <laughs> Armenian nationalist and I, and I write a fucking Turkish history book. It's going to be stilted. Uh, like, yeah, exactly. It, it's not wrong to point that out um it's like any fucking cavalry history book is <laughs> is not going to look good to native americans yeah that's true and this so this book the arab mind is even worse uh could you guess who picked it up and kind of treated it something like a bible uh i'm gonna go with uh somebody like john bolton or mike Ye pompeo Right on the ball. Uh, it was snapped up by the ghouls of pro-war Washington the months before the 2003 U.S. invasion of Iraq. Uh, it was considered an incredibly insightful way to figure out how the Arab mind worked. Uh, and if you can assume where this goes with all these books, uh, with all these chapters on uh, sexual humiliation, uh, it, was, it was used to justify, explain, and cite it as a major contribution to prisoner abuse at Air, uh, Abu Ghraib prison. Uh, because yeah. of, according to Patai, the book, uh, the only the only thing that uh, Arabs understood was force, and their biggest weakness was sexual humiliation. Yeah. Uh, whoops. <laughs> um, yeah, Jesus. 
Yeah, America, <laughs> Iraq is never going to forgive America for Abu Ghraib, and they never should. No, they absolutely should not. Um, but no. don't worry, that one specialist was thrown in prison, so the the re- <laughs> the, the real problem is taken care of. Uh, and yeah, so exactly. that is that. That's the background of the of Norville. Um, he wrote the foreword to one of the most racist books I've ever heard of. That is actually considered a history book. Uh, now, yeah, exactly. now in the year of our Lord uh, 2019, it is largely considered a pile of shit and discredited. Uh, but you know, it took a it while. It still helps, you know. It, it, it helped feed into what became probably the greatest crime of the 21st century, namely the invasion of Iraq. Also, uh, oh. Norville has not backed down from his forward. Um, oh, of course not. As recently as 2004, when Seymour Hirsch uh, published his piece for the from the New Yorker, which kind of la- uh, laid out how this book was used to justify a lot of shit. Uh, Norville was like, whoa, 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 you totally misunderstood. And then went on, <laughs> went on to explain why, no, everything in the book is still 100% right. <laughs> so he's a, he's a piece of like, shit. Yeah, I guess we should get to the, uh, the article itself. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, also, like, just a real quick um, aside here. Uh, Norville um, is... He has the, the, the resume of anyone who could consider themselves a quote-unquote expert on quote-unquote Arab armies as like some singular concept. He, uh, he taught at the American – or was a graduate of the American University of Beirut. So like he, um, he has the bona fides. He helped teach or advise like the Egyptian army, the Lebanese army, I think the Jordanian army for like a very long time. So you would think he would have all the bona fides. But no, he's still super fucking racist and wrong as hell, which we will get into. Um, so I guess to start out the article, um, well, okay. First of all, the article is called why Arabs lose wars. It's like, you know, kind of from the start, you're kind of like, Hmm. All right. And, uh, but then he starts out like uh, his first sentence is relatively reasonable. Um, Arabic speaking armies have been generally ineffective in the modern era, which like, yeah, I mean, sure. I guess that's true. Um, and again, the problem with this article is not necessarily the idea that Arabic speaking armies have generally been ineffective in the modern era. The problem is how he argues it. Um, and, uh, so like there's only a handful of statements that are like entirely true, but even how he presents those statements are like very, you know, problematic, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, the, um, it's, it's like the, the clock is right. A uh, broken clock is right twice a day or whatever. Yeah, like, you know, but it's still broken. <laughs> that's a really broad brush to start with and you're like yeah okay and then you read okay. further into the, it's like okay now yeah, read yeah. two two lines down <laughs> yeah well, it's kind of funny because like soon after that he kind of realizes or like subconsciously realizes the whole idea is stupid because he says um quote when culture is considered in calculating the relative strengths and weaknesses of opposing forces it tends to lead to wild distortions especially when it is a matter of understanding why states unprepared for war enter into combat flush with confidence the temptation is to impute cultural attributes to the enemy state that negate its superior numbers or weaponry, or the opposite, to view the potential enemy through the prism of one's own cultural norms. However, I mean, he of course says this, except now that he's doing it about Arabs, it's okay to do that. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> And then he says, uh, quote, culture is difficult to pin down. It is not synonymous with an individual's race nor ethnic identity, end quote. Of course, he then proceeds to write a very long article <laughs> called Why Arabs Lose Wars. <laughs> Cultural um, is re- culture is really hard to pin down. Anyway, here's my uh, 10,000 word thesis on why this culture sucks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so he then, in the next paragraph, he cites uh, John Keegan, the quote, eminent historian of warfare. And so I, think I you have fucking some hate to... John Keegan. Um, yeah. So anybody who has taken uh, more than uh, one or two uh, military history classes or even picks up military history books, you've probably at least accidentally read one of his books. Um, he is considered a preeminent military historian when it comes to World War II, more specifically the SS, um, <laughs> uh, to the extent that people have accused him of um, dipping into the the clean Wehrmacht theory, uh, 
kind of trying to say that the SS is they're totally elite troops and then they kind of did some war crimes but like that I mean, like on that, the side. that's not a, that's neither here nor there I uh, Travis will talk about that um <laughs> John Keegan is also a piece of shit and this is why <laughs> um yeah John Keegan once uh claimed another historian a guy named John or sorry David John Cal- Codwell Irving a uh, very British name here uh it was a good historian. Uh, Irving is famously known for being the guy who did not denied the Holocaust so much. He got brought to court over it. <laughs> um, now, admittedly uh, to give Keegan, at least one good point here, Keegan called Irving out for being a Holocaust denier, but then he still said he was a good historian. That is so fucking stupid. I literally can't even yeah. think straight, like being a Holocaust denier and a good historian is like saying that someone who can't multiply or add or subtract or some shit will still be a good mathematician. It's total yeah, exactly. fucking <laughs> bullshit. And yeah. And just to go like how weird Irving is, a guy that Keegan gave credit to, he actually want Irving went to court once to defend another Holocaust denier, a guy named Ernst Zindel, who was put on trial for Canada f- uh, for inciting racial hatred. Uh, but <laughs> Irving needed help, like he needed a scientist, right, to prove that uh, Zundel couldn't possibly be inciting racial hatred because the Holocaust totally didn't happen. Uh, so he got uh, help in the form of a guy named Fred Lucher, who is a traveling electric chair salesman from Boston. Uh, L- Lucher decided to break into Auschwitz-Birkenau and break off pieces of the concrete gas chamber wall to prove that gas is never used there. Oof. <laughs> Again, fuck you, John Keegan. Yeah, fuck you, John Keegan, and and fuck you, Norval, for citing John Keegan. Um, but yeah, like uh, Keegan absolutely like jerks off to the SS, and so you know that Norville also probably jerks off to the SS, um, also. And uh, he probably it's one of those like, well, they look cool in their uniforms type thing. Yeah, exactly. Like completely ignoring like all the times that the SS was actually really bad at war. Um, which I guess we'll kind of talk about a little bit later in, yeah. in a little terms, but us. Uh, so okay, so Norville then proceeds to you know to write some more racist shit. So he says, um, even the much lauded Egyptian crossing of the Suez in 1973, at its core, entailed a masterful deception plan. Okay, fine, all right, fair. But then it's he deception. says. <laughs> yeah, everyone does it, right? But then he says, it may well be that these seemingly permanent attributes result from a culture that engenders subtlety, indirection, and dissimulation in personal relationships. Holy shit. <laughs> Oof. Yeah, I mean, so, like... Okay. He's, he's just attributing every fucking bad thing that's ever happened in military history to being part of Arab culture. But he's also saying some of the best master strokes in modern Arab military history is also because of bad things in Arab culture. Exactly. This is so like, fucking stupid. And I love the fact that it's like he just kind of like makes up racial stereotypes about Arabs too. Like you have the shifty I, Arab. Yeah, exactly. Because I think later on he talks about how like Arabs don't trust anybody outside of their family unit. Yes, but here he's he like, does. <laughs> but but here he's like um, Arabs like in personal relationships they're always like in, being indirect and dissimul- d- dissimulating. Um, and subtle in their personal relationships. So it's like, which is it, Norville? Like, <laughs> if you're gonna be racist, like at least be consistently racist. Uh, and racist, also, like, racists this, are just not known for their consistency these days. Exactly, and it's like, yeah, the the using misdirection and like counterintelligence and military strategy is like like day one at the military academy is like, oh, like make sure your enemy doesn't know what you're gonna do next. Like that's day one. And uh, that's, that's been part of military strategy since people started stabbing each other with fucking pointy sticks. Exactly. Like even like <laughs> if not even you don't even have to be like the dumbest primate to use like misdirection in like their fights for mates or food or whatever. Like every animal in the world uses misdirection. We like, do when we go from, fucking like, fishing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like misdirection is like basic strategy for literally every living creature 
I mean, the um, the, the fucking uh, D Day invasion was it was preempted by massive amounts of misdirection. The fucking exactly. Gallipoli invasion, massive amount. Ma- I mean, that's a <laughs> great example of misdirection failing. Uh, the fucking uh, yeah. the whole Somme campaign was misdirection. Like, yeah. this is fucking insane. <laughs> yeah, like it's it's misdirection isn't some like uniquely Arab thing. And if it if it was, like, damn, we should be taking notes. It, it, it's um, a uniquely Arab thing when we're trying to make them sound bad because now they're shit. It, it's, it's like it's like the fucking episode of The Simpsons where Homer isn't sure how to make the dog the bad guy, so he just makes it look <laughs> shifty. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Ugh, okay, but then he the next guy he cites he says blah 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 along these lines Kenneth Pollock blah blah blah. Um, so this guy Kenneth Pollock, um, he's. A pretty famous neoconservative who was one of the most ardent supporters of the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Um, God, and why is this convinced... all one giant fucking circle? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, he was Pollock was convinced that Iraq had an advanced nuclear weapons program, which womp womp. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's kind of funny. So Kenneth Pollock, before the invasion of Iraq, he wrote a book called Threatening Storm, The Case for Invading Iraq. And then in, I want to say 2006 or 2007, he wrote a book called Things Fall Apart, containing the spillover from an Iraqi civil war. (laughs) And then then a couple of years later, he wrote a book called A Path Out of the Desert, a Grand Strategy for America in the Middle East. So it's like a story in three parts. (laughs) (laughs) A story of how I'm really bad at my job. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Like, How do these people still get like you know books published or like places on tv they're wrong this is like buying a fucking marriage advice book from scott peterson yeah exactly like what the fuck are you trying to do like you're wrong every single time you (laughs) say fucking anything about the middle east or like literally like they probably don't even know how to tie their own shoes like they're wrong about everything and yet they're still paid like fifty thousand dollars to be or like a month to be a fellow at the american enterprise institute or some bullshit <laughs> fucking think tanks are the devil and like yeah, seriously. and the best part is is like he wrote all i mean he wrote these books after this was after this article was written but i mean yeah. these the, he had the same fucking ideas yeah. and they then, all had the same ideas. and then they're they fucking all, cited yeah exactly um, okay, but then uh, the next passage that I thought was funny was, uh, quote, Vietnamese communists did not fight the war the United States had trained for, nor did the Chechens and Afghans fight the war the Russians had prepared for. This entails far more than simply retooling weaponry and retraining soldiers. It requires an understanding of the enemy's cultural mythology, history, attitude towards time, etc., demanding a more substantial investment in time and money than a bureaucratic organization is likely to authorize, end quote. What? And I'm like, dude, what? The, Vietnam, <laughs> the, the Vietnam War lasted more than 10 years, and the French had been fighting it since, like, the 1940s. So by what the time grandpa. the United States got <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag French Foreign Legion. You know? uh, but by the time the U.S. got involved in any significant way in Vietnam, we knew exactly what kind of war it was going to be. Yeah. But because we're just like dumb as shit and the U.S. military is institutionally incapable of changing doctrine. We spent a decade fucking up over and over again and we lost the war. We, th- we lost Vietnam because we're stupid and didn't understand what the kind of war we were getting into. This is the, the dumbest the fucking war. argument I've ever heard in my life. Yeah, we, they exactly. didn't fight the war. They trained. That's fucking war. Like, are you supposed to yeah. exchange <laughs> notes beforehand? Like, so how are we going to do this? You're going to fucking yeah, meet at the playground at five? <laughs> yeah. Like, it wasn't like the shifty Vietnamese or the shifty <laughs> Arabs that tricked us into fighting a war that we were unprepared for. We started these fucking wars. We started Vietnam. We started Afghanistan. The Soviets invaded Iraq. Chechnya. Yeah. Like, and this, yeah, and the Soviets invaded Chechnya. Also, and the French that's, colonized Vietnam. Like, and that's complete bullshit. Like, the, the <laughs> Chechens fought the Russians in the first Chechen war in a conventional war and won exactly. using Soviet trained <laughs> military officers. You exactly. stupid fuck. They were literally exactly. fucking teammates two years before. Yeah, like we started all of these wars knowing exactly what we were getting into and we still lost. Um, <laughs> yes. So I guess to, to quote the guy who was influenced by these idiots, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, uh, can't, uh, can't, can't get fooled again. 
And, and be said, right, to quote these fucking assholes, I think it was Donald Rumsfeld that says you go to war with the army that you have, not the army that you want. So okay, go dude, f- don't go to war, dipshit. Yeah, Jesus. fuck you, Norville. <laughs> yeah. Um, OK, so then he says, uh, let's see. Um, Arabs husband information and hold it especially tight. U.S. trainers have often been surprised over the years by the fact that information provided to key personnel does not get much farther than them. Having learned to perform some complicated procedure, an Arab technician knows that he is invaluable so long as he is the only one in a unit to have that knowledge. Once he dispenses it to others, he no longer is the only font of knowledge and his power dissipates. And it's I'm called like, Dude, fucking job security! Exactly. Everyone does that shit. Like I do that. Uh, I'm actually. I plead the fifth. I'm not gonna. <laughs> I did that uh, all the on. fucking time. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, exactly. It's a basic principle of job security. Everyone does that. It's not some uniquely Arab thing. Um, and then he says, thinking outside the box is not encouraged. And I'm like, dude, have you ever talked to like an American military officer? Like, when has thinking outside the box? ever been rewarded in the u.s military and this is not an arab thing whatsoever the fucking so i'm balls deep researching this the soviet afghan war but that was they were so locked into terrible fucking doctrine entire battalions sat on roads and got murdered without running away or driving away or even getting out of their vehicles to fight because it was not encouraged to do anything without orders from above Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> this is yeah. he's just uh, giving every negative attribute that anybody can think if you were to make the worst combat unit of all time and you'd pick out all the things they would do terribly he's just attributing them all to arab culture exactly. <laughs> this is and fucking not to, insane like, anything else yeah it's yeah. because of arab culture not because of like a billion different complex and dynamic other reasons that would lead to like, for example, the failure of the Syrian army in the 1967 Arab Israeli war. No, it's because of Arab culture. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Okay. So then he goes on to say, quote, oh, this is a bit of a long paragraph. So bear with me. Quote, most Arab officers treat enlisted soldiers like subhumans. When the winds in Egypt one day carried biting sand particles from the desert during a demonstration for visiting U.S. dignitaries, I watched as a contingent of soldiers marched in and formed a single rank to shield the Americans. Egyptians, uh, Egyptian soldiers, in other words, are used on occasion as nothing more than a windbreak. The idea of taking care of one's men is found only among the most elite units in the Egyptian military. On a typical weekend, officers in units stations outside Cairo will get in their cars and drive off to their homes, leaving the enlisted men to fend for themselves by trekking across the desert to a highway and flagging down buses or trucks to get to the Cairo rail system. Garrison cantonments have no amenities for soldiers. The same situation in various degrees exists elsewhere in the Arabic-speaking countries, less so in Jordan, even more so in Iraq and Syria, end quote. That's so dumb. My first impression is like, whoa, Cairo has a rail system. I guess they're more advanced than fucking all of America. Um, <laughs> you know, and like the, the concept of taking, quote unquote, taking care of soldiers is new. Uh, it's very yeah. new. The, Exceptional, so. And, and it's only really a thing in Western militaries with f- fucking fountains of money that never end. Yeah. Like exactly. all these like, like movie theaters and fucking uh nice places to live on military posts which aren't even universal in the united states mind you i I lived in a barracks building that was so overgrown with fucking black mold that like (laughs) they wouldn't house pregnant women in it yeah like if a woman was was pregnant they had to sign a fucking document saying they would not (laughs) sue for hood if they stayed in it yeah i was just thinking like what what does he think american soldiers do when they got a weekend off at like fort polk louisiana yeah like I, I, I wasn't stationed in Fort Polk because I wasn't in the army, but I am from Louisiana and I know that there's jack shit to do there. Like, and also I know the base is garbage because I have plenty of friends who have been there. <laughs> I've, I've heard it's complete hell. And like yeah. uh, this concept that like um, they're treating their soldiers like shit because they're not giving them rides or whatever. That's more of emblematic of their military isn't paid anything. And like exactly uh, even uh, an E1 in the army, uh, the U.S. Army now can afford a car, not a new one. But they'll go get a new one anyway. But <laughs> <laughs> with like, tw- <laughs> yeah, with 27 percent interest. But, you know, like yeah. you like you still make, you know, twenty five thousand dollars a year, give or take. Yeah, that's exactly. probably more than an egyptian captain makes 
Oh, I'm sh- I'm certain. <laughs> I'm pulling that number out of my ass, but I'm gonna assume it is. Yeah. Like that's probably like yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> this is economic, not cultural. You asshole. Exactly. exactly. Uh, so then he goes on to say, uh, the young draftees who make up the bulk of the Egyptian army hate military service for good reason, and will do almost anything, including self mutilation, to avoid it. In Syria, the wealthy buy exemptions, or failing that, are assigned to non combatant organizations. And I'm like, ah, yes. Draftees in the United States military were well known for loving military service and doing everything in their power to stay in the army. And also, the American draft system was famously egalitarian, <laughs> drafting, you know, it drafted rich white suburban college students on a level equivalent to poor black people from urban centers. In fact, the American draft system was so egalitarian that there were massive protests from poor minority minority populations just begging to be drafted in order to take the burden off of the rich white kids. Yeah, the, that whole con like this, this idea that uh, Arab armies are so terrible that people are mutilating themselves to get out of it. That sure that's <laughs> probably true conscription terrible um but that's not arab either um i mean (laughs) dodging the draft is so um so active in russia that there's like uh almost an unspoken rule that you're never going to meet any conscripts from like saint petersburg or moscow because they just buy their way out people were shooting themselves cutting their their fucking toes off going awol uh (laughs) like they just not reporting at the local conscription office but the bribes were almost like on the wall to get out like this anywhere with conscription has yeah, i mean like, and that shit happened in the u.s like during the vietnam war like yeah um, rich kid just got into the national guards so they wouldn't deploy yeah or went to college or like got some bullshit medical exemption like exactly like there's a reason the, why uh, the bush family spent the vietnam war in the air guard yeah exactly and uh so like the uh in 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 vietnam like also the the draft system was notorious for like over targeting um particularly black uh young black men from like urban centers um for the draft because it was basically impossible for them to get out of it yeah um and they were particular and since like those communities were over policed they were also more likely to be like you know rounded up by the cops for like dodging the draft and stuff like that or like unable to afford leaving the country or something like that and the the the, um, the, 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 the vietnam draft is so easy to get out at first all you have to do is be fucking married so people would just yeah, go exactly. get married in like mooney style mass fucking ceremonies and shit just to not get yeah. drafted yeah, like nobody wanted to get drafted for Vietnam. And so like this idea that like, you know, Egyptians or Syrians or whatever are like so uniquely opposed to the draft and like hate the army service so much. It's like ridiculous. Like every country with conscription with a handful of exceptions, like I would say probably Turkey, um, Israel and maybe like Singapore, like everyone hates conscription um, pretty much everywhere, be it Arab, be it white. Uh, well, shit, Asian, even whatever. in Israel, the the Orthodox Jews uh, don't have to get conscripted and they fucking hate uh, yeah, being exactly. drafted. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. the, the, there's not a single country on earth that people don't dodge the draft if the draft existed. Exactly. And yeah, it's fucking <laughs> slavery. <laughs> yeah, like nobody likes that shit. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so to move on to the next point, he says, quote, in general, the militaries are the fertile crescent enforced disciplined by fear. In countries where a tribal system still is enforced, such as Saudi Arabia, the innate egalitarianism of the society mitigates against fear as the prime minister or prime motiv- motivators, motivator. So a general lack of discipline pervades, end quote. And so I'm like, all right, just thinking of like, you know, famous military leaders who've talked about fear with their enlisted men, like... When I think of them, I think of the great Arab leader, Frederick the Great, um, (laughs) who was famous for saying that soldiers should fear their own officers more than the enemy and focus so strongly on drill and discipline that the army lost all initiative and individual inspiration. And he was famous for micromanaging generals so closely that they cannot be trusted to perform independently or effectively. And this is why the Arab Republic of Prussia lost its war against Israel in 1767. <laughs> that whole fucking thing is stupid. Um, for like F- Frederick the Great um, w- was so brutal that he actually had, you know, outrunners. Like he, he changed the way his army marched so he could catch <laughs> deserters because he had so many of yeah. them. <laughs> yeah. oh, Jesus. Um, all right. What's the next bit? Uh, 
Okay, so he says, a dramatic example of like the gap between officers and enlisted occurred during the Gulf War when a severe windstorm blew down the tents of Iraqi officer prisoners of war. For three days, they stayed in the wind and rain rather than be observed by enlisted prisoners in a nearby camp working with their hands, end quote. So I looked this up, and uh, I didn't find any other source for this story. And to be honest, it sounds like bullshit That to sounds me. totally fucking um, made up. Like there's yeah, no I mean, there's they, no one on earth that like you could fucking drop Saudi nobility out in the desert and they're gonna be like fuck this and put in a tent up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean like on it like maybe it happened. Like I'll give him a benefit of the doubt. Maybe it happened. I wasn't there, whatever. But it's the, certainly if it did, it's certainly not indicative of some like wider trend of the Arab mind and or the, whatever. The, the, that story is got it like i have a hard time picturing it because this is the same army that was surrendering by the tens of thousands at once yeah and that they didn't want to be dishonored by having their soldiers watch them work bitch you just surrendered yeah. like that yeah. that doesn't make any I, fucking I, sense yeah and like again and you know maybe he'll you know come into our twitter dms or something and be like no it totally happened like here's a picture or whatever and like sure whatever norville if you dm me a picture of this happening like Thank you. I'll accept the picture and I'll agree that it happened. I'm gonna, However, I'm gonna fucking DM a picture of my <laughs> asshole. Fuck him. <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, but like seriously, like Norville, that's not some like Arab thing. Like if that if that truly did happen, like that's just some weird shit. Not like some Arab thing. Um, and okay, so he goes on and he, I'd say his most valid point in the whole thing is uh, he talks about how a lot of Arab armies had. Uh, small or weak uh, NCO or non-commissioned officer corps, which were insufficient to maintain unit cohesion between and like maintain the divide between enlisted and officers. And like, honestly, that's a fair criticism. I don't know enough about like the Egyptian or the Syrian armies during the time period he's talking about to say that he's like necessarily wrong about it. Um, however, I will say that the problem with this is claiming that this is somehow unique to Arabs or a result of Arab culture. Yeah, that's um, not at all. Tr- the, the weak NCO core and uh, the lack of um, the the unit cohesion there between uh, officers and enlisted, that's kind of a hallmark between armies ran by strongmen or dictators um, yeah. because nobody wants to be the nail that sticks out. Yeah. And that's not Arab culture. That's just shitty strongman culture. Mm-hmm. I mean, that you yeah, saw exactly. you saw that uh, a lot during the uh, the Iran Iraq War on the Iraqi side, where um, uh, officers and NCOs simply did not act without orders. And, yeah, exactly. And I mean, if officers aren't going to act without orders, NCOs sure the fuck aren't going to engender any kind of fucking morale boosting anything. And you saw yeah, exactly. that significantly more on the Iranian side. Which is interesting because they are also a dictatorship in the middle of purges, yeah, but exactly. whatever. <laughs> yeah. Well, also, like, um, interestingly, like, a lot of the blame for kind of an aristocratic officer corps with a weak, uh, like, NCO corps, I think you can honestly place a lot of that blame on the British oh, and French definitely. colonial rule. Um, because they had a habit of having their NCOs and officers be either white or from, like, a higher tier of colony. So I know like the Iraqi army under British rule had a lot of Indian NCOs and officers as well as like white um, like staff officers and stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, and so and so when the when Iraq gained independence, basically all they had left was like a handful of Iraqi NCOs and uh, officers who had been trained under the British system and like a bunch of like peasant troops with no training um, or education because, you know, the British love to divide and conquer and, uh, keep their, uh, colonial, uh, basically their colonial slaves, uh, unable to actually rise up. Yeah. And, that uh, was, that was definitely part, part and parcel of how they did things. I mean, like, yeah. uh, n- not in the middle East, but in the Congo, that's what the Belgians did. I mean, the, the yeah. white people were officers and, uh, black people could possibly be NCOs. Um, and that was it. Like so, when you when you strip away the uh, like the entire leadership system, like that's that's a mili- that's actually a, a fucking military tactic to defeat your enemy is to decapitate exactly. them from yeah. their leadership. <laughs> yeah. And so you're and so what you're left with in these countries uh, that have been devastated by colonial rule um, is you're left with a military that is kind of bereft of any significant military culture or tradition. 
And uh, so I, for a brief period, my freshman year of college, I was like, I read a shitload of books about like Indian military history um, after uh, after independence. And it was super interesting. So India fought a border war with China in 1963. And one of the, the, um, the, the main topics they were talking about in the book I was reading was this divide between the kind of old guard in the Indian army who were extremely British in like culture and doctrine and affectation. Um, you know, they had been trained at Sandhurst and had fought in World War II uh, in the Indian army and stuff like that. And then you had the new guard who wanted to create like a uniquely Indian military tradition. Um, the old guard in 1963 was in charge and India lost the war against China. But by 1971 with the war against Pakistan, um, the kind of the tables have turned and the kind of new Indian military tradition had become much stronger with like a, a, a unique way of like the having Indian officers and like an Indian officer tradition, Indian NCOs and an Indian NCO tradition and so on. And they won the war with Pakistan. They had like high quality leadership and uh, in a well-developed NCO corps by that point. I mean, like relative to similarly developed countries. And uh, so the the idea that like the Arabs – in the like 1967 war against Israel, that their NCO Corps was so bad because of some like uniquely Arab trait is not true. I mean, that's just a post-colonial problem combined with uh, the similar problems in like pretty much every autocratic dictator uh, dictatorship that exists is you don't want a strong NCO Corps. <laughs> um, right. And it, and, and, the, and that, you don't want officers to be anything more than loyalists to you. Right. That's one of the things that, dictators around the, the the world love is they don't want talent they want loyalty that was a hallmark of saddam's army that was a hallmark of the fucking soviet command that was a hallmark of nazi germany exactly. <laughs> this, yeah. this is an arab i mean shit even now uh in the in the u.s that hurts your career i mean you won't, you won't yeah, get exactly. shot in the back of the head like some countries but it'll definitely dent your fucking resume yeah, no, exactly. Um, so then the next the next bit that I really thought was funny was um, he says, quote, U.S. trainers can find it very frustrating when they repeatedly encounter Arab officers placing blame for unsuccessful operations or programs on the U.S. equipment or some other outside source. Um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, General Khalid bin Sultan, the Saudi ground forces commander, requested a letter from General Norman Schwarzkopf stating it was U.S. Uh, it was it was the U.S. general who ordered an evacuation from the Saudi town of uh, Khafji, I believe. Um, in his account of the battle, General Bin Sultan predictably blames the Americans for the Iraqi occupation of the town, when in reality the problem was that the light Saudi forces in the area left the battlefield. The Saudis were in fact outgunned and outnumbered by the Iraqi unit approaching Khafji, but the Saudi pride required that foreigners be blamed. Like, I read this and I was like, holy shit, dude. Americans literally blame losing the entire Vietnam War on, like, hippies smoking too much weed. Um, that was an entire PragerU video. <laughs> exactly. And, like, somehow these hippies convinced the, you know, the famous peacenik Richard Nixon to withdraw from Vietnam because he was, I guess, too much of a pussy or something. <laughs> and uh, and then again, like, the, the failed occupation of Iraq after 2003 is often blamed on, like, not having enough soldiers because apparently 150,000 wasn't enough instead yeah. of, like, the high, the whole idea of invading and occupying Iraq just being dumb as fuck from the beginning. It, it's, um, like, it's like a... a it's a not a it's not a bug it's a feature in, in every military operation that you lose nobody's like my bad like it doesn't exist yeah, exactly. it never fucking exists like it, even people who are considered decent historians of world war ii they're like oh, yeah germany would have won except for this one thing like that's not how this fucking works no <laughs> and it's like this little one thing usually ends up being like the whole ideology of Nazism. Yeah, the whole like starting the war thing, and like <laughs> yeah. and then this whole thing like oh well uh, you know they the, their pride uh, requires them to blame foreigners. No, their career requires them exactly. to blame someone else for their failures. Yeah. That's a yeah. feature in every. So like I, I guess you could say military uh, military careers are a. Um, uh, they they require you to be good at your job most of the time, and when you mm -hmm. lose, that's bad for you, <laughs> unless you can find a way out. <laughs> yeah, and that way out usually involves blaming anything, anything other than and everything. I I have been blamed by so many people for shit I had no control of, and I have also done it. <laughs> like yeah. when you're yeah. a fucking team leader and you don't 
complete the mission. It's not because you're a bad team leader. It's because you have bad soldiers. I've literally yeah. heard that conversation from, I'm going to say at least a hundred people. And uh, there, there's veterans who are, will listen to this podcast. Like, yep, I've definitely said that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's not yeah. fucking general Ben Sultan being, uh, <laughs> being Arab. That's him not wanting to get fucking killed. He works for the yeah. king. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or like demoted or fired or like right. he's trying to keep his job. Like that's what everyone does. I mean, is and, it uh, shitty? Yeah, but, but it's it's how the world how the world works. That's how know? that's how fucking corporate works. I mean, there was an entire office episode about this where they pass yeah. the blame of the saber store and fire somebody. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think it's particularly funny that this uh, anecdote is about the battle of uh, of Hafji because I actually talked about this battle in my uh, um. And my thesis that I wrote about the Iran-Iraq war and like the Iraqi mil- military industry because it was Iraq's pretty much only military victory. And it's funny because um, in the counterattack, which was successful in repelling Iraqi forces, um, Americans, uh, um, the American military succeeded in killing like dozens of its own people. Wasn't um, it with an airstrike or something like that? Yeah, it was like an AC-130 combined with airstrikes just like massacred the shit out of I think they're of- Marines. Yeah, I think it was like two dozen Marines got killed um, by friendly fire. And I think it's like really hilarious because I want to write a book called like The White Mind and uh, and say like, you know, whites are like, you know, predisposed to friendly fire incidents because they're too stupid to uh, to like understand the difference between the Iraqi army and the American army. That was like oh. a, a a fucking hallmark of the Gulf War is like they gave, yeah. they gave a ton of people uh, like this advanced technology and I don't think anybody trained on it beforehand because they just started murking the shit out of each other. Yeah, exactly. Like so much friendly fire. And I mean, I, I ended up reading like a, a, a Wikipedia article, like list of friendly fire incidents of like the Afghan war. And like it is extensive and it's mostly oh, yeah. like eight. A-10s, like, just murdering British soldiers, like, and Canadians. all the time. <laughs> yeah, there, like, there we was, just, like, murder the shit out of Canadian and British soldiers. There was a incident, I think, outside of either Kandahar Airfield or Camp Nathan Smith in Kandahar. I'm in both places I've been. I honestly don't remember where the fuck it happened at. But, um, <laughs> uh, it was, like, the Air National Guard unit swore they are taking fire and, uh, engaged, uh, the uh, the ground target with some like 500 pound bombs or something i don't, I don't remember mm-hmm. and it was canadian soldiers at a range <laughs> yeah. and they killed a lot of them and nobody ever got in trouble for it like yeah. but no well, clearly think... the, the 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 known arab pilots from the <laughs> air national guard you know part of their culture i can't understand it yeah yeah no exactly um okay so then he talks about how um, in the 1967 war, the Jordanian, Egyptian, and Syrian armies failed at combined arms warfare and were in, ultimately, as a result of that, ineffective at defeating uh, the Israeli army. And uh, that's and he talks true-ish. about how it's like because of you know because of uh, and like that's fine. But then he's like, it's because of the well-known last lack of trust among Arabs for anyone outside their own family adversely affects offensive operations whoa <sighs> yeah whoa. Whoa, dude like okay that's gonna like, be dude, a like, fucking combined... yikes for me bro <laughs> like i award one yike to this <laughs> um but like like combined like i'm not even in the army and like i know combined arms operations are just like hard as fuck they are really um, really hard um like and US i was never military. an officer or anything and exactly like, yeah. it, it was hard from just being a soldier and you, that's like yeah. the least you do is just run around with a gun <laughs> yeah exactly like failing to adequately coordinate a modern division level combined arms offensive is not particularly surprising like the u.s only barely pulled it off in 1991 and in 2003 and in the process we killed like so many of our own dudes that like i think we can only barely quantify it as a success so like i don't really right. think we can blame serious failure and their combined arms assault against Israel on some like uniquely Arab cultural trait, and uh, look and, like, who they're again, fighting they, too. I mean, exactly. look, look who fighting we were an fighting. Enemy. Yeah. yeah, and they were fighting like, a peer. They were fighting a peer yeah. enemy. Like we have not fought a peer since arguably the Korean War. Yeah, and and exactly like you could you could 
you could argue that Syrian and Egyptian army officers have more experience in combined arms near peer warfare than any American officer. Alive Absolutely. Today. I mean, uh, assuming that they're still around, but like, you know, the, the U S fought uh, combined arms like several times, like in Panama, Grenada, uh, Gulf war, Gulf war two electric boogaloo, shit like that. Um, but the, the, the reason why we were able to trip over our own dicks into success is because we were fighting someone that was 30 years behind the time. And in the c- case of Gulf war one, which he is obviously writing about cause Gulf war two hadn't happened yet. They just got done fighting one of the most brutal wars of the 20th century. Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) And and like, even if that is like, but like uh, your average American soldier in terms of training, they probably cost like a million dollars. At least. Yeah. Um, I I probably, I probably cost the American taxpayer over a million dollars within the eight years I was in. Yeah, easily. Um, And training alone, like training and equipment alone. Um, But meanwhile, like we're supposed to look down on the Syrian army, which like maybe maybe spends ten thousand dollars per soldier on like training and equipment and then we're gonna say that they failed because they're arab like, no, no they failed because they they're failed poor because they're, they failed because they're poor and they failed because combined arms warfare is fucking hard and especially when you're um, fighting a, i mean i would say uh, uh fighting israel at that point uh they're the near peer to israel rather than the other way around like israel had exactly. better weapons better tactics and better training at, by that point Much and better funding as well yeah the pipeline had been oh this isn't the war of independence like the pipeline yeah. had been opened at this point yeah. they um, had unlimited supplies from the united states yeah which the syrians and egyptians did not they had they had a lot of support from the soviet union but that i mean that say what you will that, that normally are at this point of the the cold war the u.s weapons were significantly better assuming you yeah. could keep them running and like yeah, yeah. The, the the they weren't fighting this wasn't the, uh, a fuck up like the war of independence was which was irrevocably a massive fuck up on the arabs part they yeah, definitely should have won that war <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, but like 67 and 73 were not some like arab cultural fuck up it was it was just the fact that they that war was gonna be hard from the start Right. And uh, there were lots of other problems. And also, like, the, quote, well-known lack of trust among Arabs for anyone outside their own family. Like, dude, what the fuck? Like, that's <laughs> not even a real racist stereotype. Like, yeah, I think he just, just like, made one up. up. racist shit. Like, uh, what? Come and, on, man. And also, during those wars, he's blaming a lot of this on Arab culture. But, I mean, like, during, the, during those wars, there was a lot of British NCOs and officers in the Jordanian army. I mean, yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. At, at independence. And they still failed. Yeah, the, the, at independence, the Jordanians... Uh, actually offered uh, a lot of money if they resigned their commission the british army and stayed and they stayed yeah. <laughs> like that the, the, the wasn't a uniquely arab fuck up as much as it was like a collective fuck up yeah exactly uh, uh, so it, then he says oh, sorry oh no go ahead so then he says uh the complex mosaic of mosaic systems of peoples creates additional problems for training as rulers in the Middle East make use of sectarian and tribal loyalties to main power. This has direct implications for the military where sectarian considerations affect assignments and promotions. All right, two points. That's stupid. First, first, the British started this shit. Divide and conquer was like their MO, and it's not like militaries outside of the Middle East have never had issues with ethnic, religious, or racial divides. Um, the U S military was segregated until after the second world war. And as recently as Vietnam, like we mentioned, combat units were extremely disproportionately made up of a young black or other minority populations as they were seen as more expendable than like, you know, the white boys from the suburbs. Like the, um, the and whole also, Soviet like, doctrine was based on sectarianism. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that was supposed uh, to be like the workers paradise of the world. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so like the this idea, OK, so he says like sectarian considerations affect assignments and prom- promotions. And like, yeah, that was true. But like also like how many how many black officers like general officers do we have in the U.S.? Not many. Like not many. A handful. Now compare that to how many black enlisted personnel there are. A lot. Um, there was a like a, a, the, in the U.S. Army, that's still pretty rife. And in, like, the Soviet Army, uh, if you were, uh, like, from the Caucasus, which is ironic because, you know, one of their premiers was from the Caucasus, or, or like, <laughs> Central Asia, um, like, if you if you were from the Central Asian Republic, they called you a black ass, 
and yeah. you were not allowed to do anything other than be motor rifles because yeah. they th- and even then you weren't allowed to drive the motor vehicles because they thought <laughs> yeah. you were too fucking stupid to learn Russian. Like they thought they yeah, were exactly. too dumb to handle technical jobs. And uh, yeah. there was only very few officers from the Central Asian Republics. Like, yeah, exactly. Racism is not a fucking <laughs> part of it isn't a unique part of Arab culture. Racism is not a human a problem. problem. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so he talks about how, again, like, you know, Egypt, Syria and Jordan didn't work together great in 67 and 73 because they didn't trust each other. And again, fair criticism. Sure. There's plenty of reasons that Egypt, Syria and Jordan lost the 67 and 73 wars. But again, like acting like this is specific to Arab states or Arab culture is stupid. I mean, the the Nazis, the Nazis, the Axis powers in World War II were infamously distrustful of each other. And Hungarian, Romanian, and Italian troops um, on the Eastern Front especially were extremely resentful of the Germans because German yeah. High Command kind of ran the show, but they used Hungarian, Romanian, and Italian troops as cannon fodder in order to spare German lives. That was the whole um, reason why Stalingrad fucking fell. Like uh, yeah. the, when the Soviets launched Operation Uranus there uh, to to relieve the or to counterattack and surround the German Sixth Army, the only reason it really succeeded is because the Germans left the Romanian Third Army guarding their flanks, and the Romanian Third Army was uh, a light infantry unit that only had rifles because they considered yeah. them only a few steps above Jews and the right and their stupid racial hierarchy, yeah. and only gave them fucking rifles and hand grenades. Yeah, exactly. Like the the the. Like the 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 whitest army in the world, so the Nazi army has the exact same problems, except way worse than these like Arab armies that he's speaking of failing due to some uniquely Arab trait. Like, no, it's not some uniquely Arab trait. The fucking Nazis had the same problem, but worse. Um, and uh, is he just attributing racism as being Arab? Like <laughs> basically he talks about how these Arab countries, they balance various like factions within the military and different services off of each other in order to like maintain a balance of power and maintain the like supremacy of the dictator. Um, That's not then, like, Arab. Ag- again, like look at the Nazis again. Uh, look at which the again, Soviets. Like, this, yeah, I mean, look at that. Like, yeah. okay. With the, with the Nazis, like the SS was outside of the hierarchy of the regular military and poached resources and personnel from the regular military yeah. and vice versa. And even within the the, the normal German ar- or military, so like the Air Force, the Navy, and the Wehrmacht, the Army, um, they all poach resources and personnel from each other. And like there were actually times where they literally fought each other, like shooting at each other and killing each other for like resources and stuff between like – before like before even fighting like the French or the Soviets or the Americans or whatever, they were fighting each other. Like again, the Nazis, the yeah. whitest army, had the exact same problem. And the most one of the most homogeneous armies in the entire fucking world, the J- Japanese Imperial Army, did the same yeah. fucking thing. The, the Japanese Imperial yeah. Army and the Navy fucking hate each other to the point of killing one another. And yeah, like exactly. uh, separating uh, different directorates and ministries and shit like that was part of Soviet doctrine. Like the the yeah. the VDV had its own command. Uh, this unit had its own command. The fucking border yeah. guards had their own command. Everybody had tens of thousands of soldiers. That's not an Arab thing. That's just what dictators do to make sure they're not going to get killed yeah. in a coup. <laughs> yeah. um, and then he titles a set, an entire lengthy section called "Indifference to Safety," and I didn't even <laughs> read it um, because, like, come on, man, like. I was in ROTC and in ROTC, like I almost got shot by a couple of general officers. Like um, indifference to safety applies to every military in the world. Like some may be slightly worse than others, but like it happens all the time. I mean, in that ep- episode uh, where we're talking about the the like the mercenary death squads, there was that like special forces officer who like shot himself during training or shot his friend during training. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, like the U.S. Army may be a little bit safer on average than like the Iraqi Army. I'm sure. Oh, for sure. But yeah. like again, like this is a question not so much of like the Arab culture as of just like money. funding money. and education. Yeah. Money. It all boils down to money. Like the Iraqi army has way less money. The Iraq, Iraq as a country has way less money to spend on things like education, um, starting from like kindergarten all the way through college. So like by the time you've got a guy operating heavy machinery, maybe they don't have the same level of education or familiarity with that machinery 
as uh, an equivalent in the United States. And of course, they also don't have the same amount of money and time to spend on training that soldier because they only have, you know, $50,000 per, per soldier instead of a million dollars per soldier. And the safety um, so thing again, is fucking stupid because like the US, the Soviets, the British, I think the French all had their soldiers like run around within fallout range of nuclear weapons at one point. Yeah, exactly. And, like the British gave, have you ever seen the video of the British giving their soldiers acid and loaded weapons? Yeah. To have yeah. them run around in the woods and shit. It's fucking absurd. <laughs> but yeah, let's worry um, about safety, y'all. Yeah. Uh, and then he says, some would point to the inherent fatalism within Islam and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What? <laughs> whoa. He doesn't like provide any context to the supposed inherent fatalism within Islam. <laughs> um and then he says, and certainly anyone who has spent considerable time in Arab taxis would lend cre credence to that theory, namely that Arabs are like less safety conscious. And I'm like, dude, come on. Yes. Like, uh, Did he really just like, equate enough time, taxis to culture? Yeah. Like I've spent enough time in uh, taxis driven by Arabs or Middle Easterners or North Africans or whatever. And it's like pretty normal. I don't know. Like. They're pretty much like taxi drivers are notoriously bad everywhere. And it's, they're not like substantially worse here in like Iraqi Kurdistan versus like Turkey versus Azerbaijan versus London versus New York. Like, honestly, I felt less safe on like the freeway in Los Angeles than I do oh, here yeah. in Iraqi Kurdistan. Jesus. So, like, yeah. Me, me and Nick got a taxi in Seattle. <laughs> Uh, we were going to, I forget what we were doing. We get with a first, we got into a taxi in Seattle. Literally the first thing it did was leap into trap traffic and hit a guy on a scooter <laughs> like within 15 seconds. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like uh, Arab taxis are, they're just taxis, dude. Like taxis, taxi drivers are bad everywhere. Uh, are we really uh, using taxis as a scope into culture? Cause if, if so, we got some <laughs> fucking problems here, guys. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then, okay, so I think I've got like one or t like two more main points that I thought were pretty funny. Hit so me. this this one is uh, here we go. Um, quote: It would be difficult to exaggerate the cultural gulf separating American and Arab military cultures. In every significant area, area American military advisors find students who enthusiastically take in their lessons and then resolutely fail to apply them. The culture they return return to, the culture of their own armies and their own countries, defeats the intentions which which with which they took leave of their American instructors. End quote. And here I find it particularly telling that the onus of failure is placed on Arab troops and their respective militaries and cultures rather than American military advisors constantly and routinely failing to adjust their training styles to fit their supposed audience. Um, so if this idea of, of Arab soldiers in American training failing consistently – uh, to apply the training lessons that they learn. Why haven't American trainers changed the way that they teach? And this isn't an Arab train? army thing. I mean, yeah. what one of the largest uh, students of um, Eastern European aid uh, for the military was the Republic of Georgia. How'd that war in 2008 go, guys? Yeah. What a fucking disaster. Yeah. yeah uh, and like, like another one, Ukraine. That didn't end yeah. well. Like, is, 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 like, the American mind too stupid to realize when their training techniques fail? Like, after all, like, Americans have been using the same strategy in Afghanistan for 17 years, and it's been failing the entire time. Yeah. So, like, are Americans just incapable of change in, in any way whatsoever? Like, is this a problem with the American mind? As an expert on American culture, <laughs> um, I'm going to say another 20 years we might have this figured out. Um, yeah, <laughs> like the America's entire military idea is like one giant example of the sunk cost fallacy. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so the last point. Uh, so he says, "Quote: Arab political culture is based on a high degree of social stratification, very much like that of the defunct Soviet Union, and very much unlike the upwardly mobile meritocrat meritocratic, meritocratic, and democratic United States." Woo and I'm like, there it is. Ex ex Hit excuse me, with that me shit. while I laugh for twenty minutes straight. I mean, Jesus. Fucking Christ, this article is such dog shit. Like the famously meritocratic Inject United that shit States. Between my who's, toes, who's, my friend. Yeah. 
The American president is a senile reality show host whose lead advisor on the Middle East is a rich New York fail son who hasn't done a single goddamn thing in his entire <laughs> life except fail to sell real estate in fucking New York City where you can win a cardboard box under an overpass for 1200 a month. Like, the United States is like the least meritocratic country uh, <laughs> In the fucking world, and uh, I mean that's that's exaggeration, but like we have the fucking oh New York God. version of the Habsburg family in fucking exactly. DC like, right how, now. I mean, honestly, like, how do you possibly look at the United States military, United States corporate culture, the United like uh, the U.S. government, state governments, city governments, county governments, like just any potential hierarchy in the United States and assume that this is like some perfect meritocratic democratic society. And then you go to like, uh, you know, Egypt or something. And when the Egyptian army loses in a war against Israel, it's like, ah, it's because of the deeply hierarchical nature of the Arab mind. Uh, <laughs> it's ridiculous. I mean, the, the, the whole article is, is nonsense. Um, and uh, it kind of, when when discussing Orientalism at the beginning, like uh, you know this this author Norville B. De Atkin or whatever the fuck his name is, I feel like they should have um, Esquire at the end of it too. He his <laughs> his fucking name is just the embodiment of a top hat and a monocle. Yeah, exactly. Like if his name was like Colonel Norville B. De Atkin the Third Esquire of His Majesty's East India Company in <laughs> India, or like. He traveled across uh, Arabia to learn the Arab mind. This is, this, um, he's the person that would be like the Jameson whiskey guy who bought a girl to be eaten by uh, a cannibal so he could study it. And then that makes him a yeah, fucking... Exactly. That's something yeah. that actually happened, in case anybody yeah. was wondering. Uh, yeah, the Jameson whiskey guy bought a human being and then watched her be eaten. But uh, Shit's yeah. yeah, and then he would write a long fucking book about how he's a tribal expert. He he's fucking uh, uh goddamn L. Ron Hubbard and and his fucking video <laughs> about how he wrote about fucking ten goddamn tribes. So he's a he's a a goddamn expert. This dude upsets yeah, me exactly. to the point that it is way too early for me to be this angry. <laughs> no, I mean like claiming that Arab armies fail due to Arab culture. It's it's a ridiculous assertion, deeply in inextricably rooted in orientalist and racist assumptions about Arabs, Muslims, and the countries that make up what we call uh, the modern Middle East. And I'll use another smarter author's words to describe Atkins' article. Um, so in doing the research, I ended up reading about this guy Bernard Lewis, who he's worth a whole another episode, but he's one of those classic shitty ass orientalist um racist pieces of shit who loved the iraq war um so this uh iranian american scholar hamid dabashi wrote um an, a scathing obituary of bernard lewis when he died about a year ago um and he says um well i'm going to paraphrase it to fit the article he says why arab lose why arabs lose wars is not a work of scholarship it is a manual of style, an indoctrination pamphlet for teaching security, military, and intelligence officers in the U.S. and Europe as to why they must seek to control the Muslim world. And uh, so, go yeah, so going back to Orientalism, um, Orientalism in the United States military and governmental apparatus has meant that unprivileged voices, uh, usually people of color, both inside and outside the borders of the United States, you know, black Americans or citizen, citizens of impoverished, impoverished Muslim countries like Iraq and Afghanistan, which themselves have been ravaged by centuries of imperialist, imperialist cruelty from the UK, France and others. These people are disproportionately targeted by American state terrorism. Um, in the 1960s, COINTELPRO led to the assassination of American, black American leaders like Malcolm X, Fred Hampton, Martin Luther King. Um, and today, the Patriot Act allows the, the state security apparatus to target Muslims within the United States. And then meanwhile, the American military wages an unceasing multi-generational war against the very concept of, quote unquote, Islamic terror, which is itself a construction of the American Orientalist Imperial Project and largely inspired by um, the Orientalist narratives espoused by people like Norville B. De Atkin and other people, Bernard Lewis, uh, Keegan, um, Fareed Zakaria. Yeah, Patai, Samuel Huntington is another big one you'll probably read about um, if you're taking a, like a political science course in college. Um, and many other of these kind of people. 
Um, so the government, the United States government, the United States military, they have bought into this narrative. And it is, it is a self-fulfilling prophecy in many ways because um, American bombs kill Arabs and Muslims by the tens of thousands overseas. And Arabs and Muslims in the United States are considered anti-American due to their cultural and racial identity and rather than a result of any political opinion or actions that they take. Yeah, the, um, this, is, this isn't even new. Like this is uh, – um, the Soviets went through the same shit. Like uh, the Soviet Union is one of the largest uh, – to use a really bad term, rainbow nations have ever existed um, – and when they invaded Afghanistan, they looked at their own uh, Muslim supposed comrades in the, in the Central Asian republics and refused to fucking deploy them because yeah. they were afraid that they would join the Mujahideen. Like, yeah. that's, that's the same true. thing. Like, the, it, I don't understand how time is such a flat circle. <laughs> yeah. So, like, again, Orientalism and its racial and cultural extensions manifested through people who believe in its underlying ideology – and hold positions of power, it kills people, it destabilizes the world, and it helps further and expand the American imperial project, which to this day has killed oh, over a million Iraqis, a quarter of a million Afghans, tens of thousands of Syrians, hundreds of thousands of Yemenis, untold thousands more in Libya, Somalia, Lebanon, Palestine, Iran, and half a hundred other places. Uh, so basically, this shit kills people by, uh, by the hundreds of thousands. And it may seem like a harmless article that your like your weird second lieutenant friend shared on Facebook, uh, but like this shit is really bad. Um, it, it engenders bad thinking and like diseased brains yeah. and like weird col exactly. like neo colonialism. I mean, when exactly. I said I was when when you brought this up, one of the things I wanted to do is see how much this spread. And yeah. I mean, this guy's a colonel, and he w was a colonel, whatever, and he was training and teaching people in the special operations community for almost two decades. And this is before the forever war started since yeah. the forever war started. Um, there's this thing called rally point. Um, it's not like an official DOD thing. It's kind of like a weird forum for military type people. You have to validate who you are to get in shit like that. Um, mm -hmm. I found it on there and uh, I found it as uh, being posted as recently as this year and being commented by full on by full bird colonels, sergeant majors, first sergeants, things like that. Like, yep, this is exactly how I saw things too. And that's why like one of the things that struck me about this article is it, it, it is an article that looks like I could have written it with my deep understanding of the Afghan national army. And like, yeah. and it's, it's absurd. And, uh, this kind of historical revisionism to, uh, to fit like colonial narratives is one of the, the biggest reasons <clears throat> that, uh, I, that we make episodes like this. Um, yeah. I know our audience isn't fucking huge and our audience is already coming here expecting to hear shit like this from us anyway. I mean, <laughs> whatever, you know, we're, you're not going to hear us supporting wars pretty much ever. And we just make fun of people. Um, yeah. but I mean, it, even planting that that seed of um of, of this is a cultural thing and and the, it it makes you have to believe that um this is not a war as much as it's like a war against an entire people and an entire culture because this culture is is subhuman and subservient to ours it's it, it's being a colonialist on facebook which is weird exactly. but it's a thing that exists now yeah i mean we 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 laugh at um, the ridiculous racism of like the old school colonialists when they were colonizing Africa in like the 1880s or something right. like that. But like articles like this um, are basically the same shit just in 2019 or 1999. Um, it looks it looks a little bit different, but the core ideology, the, the, the basic idea remains the same and it serves the same purpose. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's important to, you know, not everyone may study post-colonial theory. Um, it's it can be pretty confusing and boring, but like understanding where uh, where these problems come from, and when people write articles like "Why Arabs Lose Wars," where their basic assumptions are wrong, um, is really important. Like you have to understand. You, you basically you can't apply. Um, an Orientalist or a racist or a culturally deterministic viewpoint um, to other people or other groups and expect to get a really good answer. Um, and, or if you do get an answer, it's going to be racist shit. 
like this article. And you um, know, one of the things that we will always do is confront historical revisionism and colonial stupid thinking yeah. in the most vulgar, offensive way possible. <laughs> and that's why I'm sending Norville a picture of my asshole. Fuck yeah. <laughs> so, Travis, thank you uh, for uh, <laughs> inflicting this article on me on, once again. Um, and I, I, not, I don't even credit you as a guest anymore. You're just the third host. <laughs> but uh, every, everybody, thank you for dealing with us for the last hour and a half as we got angry about an old white guy. Um, Ellen, thank you for letting me rant about Orientalism for an hour and a half. Not a, <laughs> it lets me do that. I'm just happy I accidentally stumbled upon uh, a traveling electric chair salesman. Because <laughs> uh, well, I wasn't aware that was a salesman. thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, that's the electrical salesman, electrical chair salesman. What's funny is uh, <laughs> a footnote to that guy is he lost his job when people found out he wasn't an engineer. Uh, he was he was just some guy that set up fucking electric chairs. And uh, when everybody moved to uh, the lethal injection, he moved to that, too. But he had no idea mm-hmm. how medicine worked. So that's why. Uh, and uh, so anyway, thank you for uh, joining us. Um you can follow Travis on Twitter at uh, Travis underscore, or sorry, Haycraft underscore Travis. You can follow me at JKS99. You can follow the show at lines underscore by. Um, thank you, everybody, and we'll see you next week. Hi, this is Nate Bethay, and I'm the producer of the Lions Led by Donkeys podcast. This show is brought to you by Audible, and as it just so happens, Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com forward slash donkeys and browse the selection of audio programs. Download his title for free and start listening. Once again, that's www.audibletrial.com forward slash donkeys to get started.